Welcome back to our ongoing series of lectures on load zone buildings. We're going to do uh, several different kinds of loads now that we would not bother to quantify in a class of this size, but which you would certainly want to be aware of in terms of your design thought process and avoiding problems over the course of your careers. Those subject areas are wind oscillation, so we're going to look at non-static wind effects, which are very difficult to quantify and are typically quantified either with uh, wind tunnel testing on flexible models or in computer simulations. We're going to talk about seismic forces, residual stresses, and thermal stresses. This is the uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which is famously known as Galloping Gertie. Um, we will go into this in more detail in the, the uh, chapter on tensile structures, but for the moment let's just make an observation that the length of this span was about 2,400 feet, and the depth of the side girder was 8 feet. And um, so when we take 2,400 and we divide by 8, we get 300. Um, so the length to depth ratio is 300. So we would call that an unbelievably shallow beam and not a very stiff beam. Now, most of you know that in a structure with a suspension element like this, any shifting load causes deformation. So the purpose of these uh, beams along the edge are stiffeners that help handle um, non-uniform loads they sort of distribute them so that the de deformations are reduced, but they're also there to resist this kind of movement, which the cables really tolerate quite easily. Now these cables, they can go down here and up there, so we never, we never see the entire bridge going up and down very much, but one side can go down while the other side goes up, and we've all experienced that effect uh, walking across uh, cable bridges in playgrounds when we were kids. Um, in the case of this structure, uh, it's deforming in a rather odd way where this beam is going down here and up there, and the beam on the other side is coming down here and going up on, on this end. So um, what can happen with a bridge like this though is both beams can go up on one end and both beams can come down on the other. But when it's like this, we end up with huge torsional deformations because the bridge is twisting tremendously. But the whole point of this beam was to stiffen it, and the problem is the beam is way too shallow to perform that function. So the, the approaches that could have been used by the designers of this bridge would be to figure out how to make the beam much deeper. They could have also used trusses on the side to shed some of the wind load that's inducing this kind of wind induced oscillation. Um, they could have also made the bridge torsionally much stronger. Um, they could have also put dampeners. And this bridge could have been saved if they had jumped on it. They could have put one or two cables down to this tower from the beams on this side and then a couple of cables here on this beam and two cables on the other side and put dampeners in those cables and they could have figured out a way to damp this bridge until they had time to uh, come up with a more serious solution. And in fact, really if they did it right, those cables would have been just fine as the damping system. Uh, this was one of those weird cases where the designer of the bridge kept looking at it and saying, this can't be happening, it can't be happening, but it was. And uh, when you see something going wrong, don't sit there and say it can't be happening. You need to get on it and do something about it. And a classic example of this would be the Millennium Bridge in London, where when it opened, they discovered that it had this weird uh, motion in it that was induced by people walking across it. Um, and we'll talk about it in more detail later. But basically, the people would walk and it would begin to move from side to side. And then they would walk in a way where they were trying to stabilize themselves, but in effect what they were doing was amplifying the movement. So it made sense to each individual to walk in a certain way to stabilize his own body, but in turn uh, that action induced even greater oscillations. So um, 
that became known as a phenomenon called lateral synchronous excitation and the designers of the bridge went immediately there and said we're going to shut this down and fix this problem and they did so unlike this bridge the millennium bridge got salvaged and is really a beautiful example that remains functional um, and is doing its job just fine this bridge unfortunately got lost along the way it collapsed when they replaced it they put in much deeper stiffening elements along the side they made them trusses so that they would help shin, uh, shed load more and they sort of overreacted by major, making a large part of the roadbed uh, steel grill so if you put your head out the window of your car and stare down it and that grill is whipping by you very fast it feels like there's nothing underneath you that was probably an overreaction but whoever designed the replacement bridge was pretty determined that the same thing was not going to happen to them okay so here's another example of a situation where um, wind induced uh, motion is a very high probability first of all when you do a tall building it tends to be whippy or or fairly flexible um, when you make it uniform in cross section like this when vortices form they form first on one side and then the vortex gets shed and then a vortex forms on the other side and so this building actually has major lateral forces for a wind load on this face it has major sideways motion back and forth due to this back and forth force of the shedding of the vortices um, the problem with a structure like this is that the vortex shedding is is very um, sympathetic in itself it reinforces itself because the vortex is continuous up the entire structure and it's one huge vortex that gets shed in an instant and then another vortex which is also huge gets shed a fraction of a second or a second later so when the wind speed reaches a certain point um, the natural uh, frequent the frequency of the vortex shedding matches one of the natural frequencies of the building and then the building begins to oscillate wildly like a tuning fork and that whole problem is made worse by these twin towers which also have shadowing effects on each other so the turbulence off of one building can aggravate the uh, turbulence effects on the other building the way this was solved by uh, Leslie Robertson who was the engineer was everywhere in the building where there were columns and trusses connecting to the columns he took the bottom cords of the trusses and connected to the that connected them to the columns which was not really necessary in terms of resisting gravity forces but became useful in absorbing the lateral forces because as the building would shift from side to side the columns would slope slightly that would induce a force in this bottom cord and by introducing the proper damping material in this bottom cord he was actually able to sap the motion now disturbing motions at the top of two and three feet can occur with only like a sixteenth or maybe a millimeter or a sixteenth of an inch of movement in the shortening of this member this bottom cord so he needed something that would get activated by relatively small movements and it looked like this um, this is the bottom cord of the truss this is uh, the attachment to the column over here you see this uh, welded up T-beam that's bolted through and there's viscoelastic material between the bottom cord and these two pieces that are attached to the column so if this material is on the order of a millimeter thick uh, and you get a millimeter of movement back and forth in this direction you get major deformation of that uh, viscoelastic material and that dampens the building this viscoelastic material can be quite stunning when you encounter it I remember many years ago in a class I had there was a professor that had a rod of this material it was about eight inches long about an inch in diameter it was black and it looked like rubber and he would throw it up in the air and you kind of assume that being looking like rubber it was going to bounce wildly around the room and of course the shape of it was such that any bouncing 
would have been really unpredictable. And so most of us were sort of covering our faces and hoping that it wasn't going to bounce in our direction. Uh, what was stunning about it, though, is this black rod would hit the floor and it was just as dead as if it had glued itself to the floor. There was uh, an incredibly effective energy um, damping. So this viscoelastic material is a material that was engineered to do that. So any little movement in this building would activate tens of thousands of these devices and they would instantly sap the energy out of the building. There's another approach to dealing with vortices and wind shedding. Uh, this is the Sears Tower. It consists of a bundle of nine tubes and the tubes are truncated at various levels. And this accomplishes two things. One is the vortices that are being shed at the top here because the cross section of the building is so small, the vortices are shed much more frequently. Down below where there's a much bigger chunk of building, the vortices are larger and they have a different natural frequency. So this building is detuning or as the people at Skidmore Owings and Merrill call it, it is confusing the vortices and basically keeping them from acting in some way of, of maximum effect on the structure. In addition, this particular building has nine of these tubes and they're also truncated at lengths where the natural frequencies of those tubes are quite different from each other. So a natural frequency of wind shedding that would stimulate one of those tubes would not have much effect on the other tubes. So they've detuned the structure and they've detuned the vortex shedding so that they don't need damping materials like what were used in the World Trade Center. So to reiterate the damping in the Sears Tower, it's not so much damping as avoiding any kind of sympathetic oscillations between the vortex shedding and the structure itself. So the vortex shedding is detuned by having many different cross sections and then the structure is detuned by having many different lengths of tubes bundled together and they tend to be suppressing each other's natural frequency of oscillation. <clears throat> this is Dorton Arena. It's a structure with wind cables in this direction, excuse me, gravity cables this way, and then it's held against kiting or flying away by wind cables across here. Because it uh, has high strength steel cable, it's possible for oscillations to be induced in this roof or for flutter to be created. But for reasons that are explained in, uh, later on in the book, uh, in the chapter on tensile structures, there's actually a slight dish in the roof here, and that portion of the roof is particularly vulnerable to flapping up and down under a wind load. Um, so to deal with this, uh, internal to Dorton Arena, you'll see the primary cables in the roof. So these are gravity cables. These are wind cables. They are pressed against each other and they counter stress each other. All these cables that are flying through the space here are strictly attached to that for purposes of damping, wind damping. So if you go to the ends of those cables that are flying through the space, you find these canisters that are filled with viscoelastic material or some kind of damping material that's intended to take energy out of the roof to keep those oscillations from ever building up. We have uh, seismic issues. Uh, there comes a moment in time where an earthquake occurs and huge amounts of the Earth's mass begins to accelerate. We can have both horizontal and vertical acceleration. And sometimes the vertical acceleration can be really extreme but we tend to mainly design for horizontal movement, particularly as it relates to high-rise buildings, because in this case, the ground is moving uh, under the building and causing enormous inertial forces. Basically, the building has a choice of either tearing and becoming detached at the base or moving with this ground acceleration. So the big issue is mass. Um, Steel and wood make lighter weight structures and there's less inertial force at the base in order to get the building to move with the ground. In the case of a building made out of concrete or even worse yet, masonry, um, these seismic forces at the base of the building are huge because of the high mass of the building. The building has to be accelerated with the ground uh, 
F equals MA, so larger mass in the building means um, that the force that occurs at the base of the building is much larger. This is particularly problematical in masonry buildings, which have almost no capacity to resist the shearing forces at the base. This is a, a base isolator from the San Francisco City Hall. It was a building that was highly vulnerable to earthquake effects. Um, they did a retrofit where under every column they uh, jacked the building up, they cut the column out, and they replaced it um, with a, an element which was a combination of a lead core and a rubber boundary. So this is this uh, silver part is it's wrapped in some kind of aluminum foil to help preserve the long-term life of the rubber. Um, but if if the aluminum foil wasn't here, this would be black, a black cylinder that's a sort of annular ring, and in the core of that is lead. And the idea is that under an earthquake, the lead is the damping material, and the rubber is what returns it to its center position. In the case of this situation, by the way, you'll notice two plates here that are bolted that connect the base to this. And then there are two other plates on the other side that you can't see. Um, this photo was taken during the retrofitting of the building. And the last thing you want to do is risk an earthquake where you've made a bunch of your columns flexible. And then the ones that are remaining that haven't been retrofitted are very rigid because then under a seismic event you shift all the burden to the rigid ones because that's the stiff uh, stress path. So these remained bolted in place until the entire building was retrofitted and then as fast as possible they removed all of these plates to assure that they wouldn't have a seismic event when part of the structure was stiff and part of it was flexible. So. Uh, in the case of earthquakes, the earth, earth moves back and forth. Uh, it has certain natural frequencies that are present. A structure has its own natural frequency, and if there's a match between the natural frequency of the structure and the ground movement, then energy can be built up. So one of the analogies we use is uh, if you want to build up energy in a child's swing set, you push the swing a little bit, and then when it comes back, you push it a little more and a little more. That's a classic example where the movement of that swing is being gradually excited or increased uh, on each cycle by an additional input of energy. Now, that kind of sympathetic oscillation can occur between ground movements and buildings. And to demonstrate this point in this model, these two screws limited the movement of this base to an eighth of an inch. So the person who's moving this structure back and forth is moving it in a way where he's sensing the movement of this and always injecting energy at a certain point in the cycle where it's increasing the oscillations of this. So uh, this is in the early stages. He's moved it back and forth about 10 times and he's beginning to get it moving pretty well. And then once that happens, he can really uh, synchronize his movement with the movement of the structure. So you're observing that from an eighth of an inch of movement at the base, he's inducing these huge oscillations. This unfortunately is what can happen in steel structures because steel structures are very energetic and they continue to oscillate. To understand how energy can get stored in a piece of steel, take a piece of steel and hit it with a hammer and it just keeps ringing for a very long period of time. That's, that's what we call a, a material that is not very dead at all. If you hit concrete or wood, you get a really different response. So those are more energy absorbing materials. Steel is very strong, very efficient, but it has vulnerability to these kinds of excitations which can occur either from wind or from seismic disturbances. Uh, in the case of earthquakes, we want to damp those movements, and we want to damp them while allowing a fair amount of movement. So you'll recall in the case of the World Trade Center, we wanted almost no movement under wind oscillations because we wanted people to be comfortable, and we wanted to really jump in and suppress the movement as fast as possible. Uh, and it worked fine to do that in the case of the wind because it starts off really slow and builds up,
and so all we have to do is make sure we damp it. In the case of a seismic event though it can be sudden and involve huge lateral movement so we need a building that is able to accommodate that. So these elements right here are very much like shock absorbers under your car or the front shocks, shocks on, a, on a mountain bike. Um, basically they allow a lot of movement and they're designed to damp that energy. And the rest of the structure of course has to be designed so that that movement can occur without damage occurring. So the nice thing about shocks like this is they restore the building to its original shape. Some buildings are protected by allowing the ductile steel to deform and absorb energy and if they're properly designed the building won't collapse even though the steel might become fairly uh, substantially deformed. The disadvantage to that is that buildings like that have to be torn down afterwards because no one wants to stay in a crooked building. It's disconcerting to people. So the beauty to these shock absorbers is that they can return the building to its original shape and it continues to be serviceable. Uh, one of the common problems we have with earthquakes is we need the greatest access at the base. That's also where the shear forces are the largest. And so you end up with what we call soft story effects like this, where uh, one story fails, but all the rest of them remain intact. You would like to avoid this. So you need a balanced design where somehow you strengthen it at the base here, even though that's where you want maximum opening. That's also where you want the strongest possible structure. So there are people that are dealing with this even in residential construction. Simpson Connectors, for example, has a rigid frame structure which introduces a steel frame at the base as a way of strengthening a structure like this. Okay, so we want to make sure we have symmetric resistance. In this case, we have resistance only on one side and not on the other side. The uh, seismic force is going to be down the center line of the building, as will the wind force. And you'll notice how this building is torquing under the influence of the force of the finger here. Um, this is a seismic map. As most of you know, in California and the West Coast, we have regular seismic events. We also have some huge seismic effects in this part of the Mississippi Valley called the New Madras Fault. And then there's also a fault, surprisingly enough, somewhere near uh, Charleston, South Carolina, where one of the most destructive earthquakes in history occurred. Okay, so now I want to talk about residual stresses. This is a structure that I uh, was aware of for many years ago. I didn't work on it, but I knew the people who did. This is a space frame on the roof, um, supported in several locations. The builder somehow misplaced the columns on this side and put them too low. When he built the building, he just started at this end and built across and kept on building out and actually had a huge gap of about eight inches here. And rather than tell some, somebody about this, he went and bought some really long bolts and put the bolts through here and just uh, cranked it down until the truss structure came to rest here. Unfortunately, that produced huge compressive forces in these cord members and the cord members buckled which in a way was a good thing because if he had succeeded in doing this, something really catastrophic might have happened when a snow load came along. But as it was, there was some damage here that alerted everyone to the fact that there was a problem. If they had succeeded in bolting this down, they would have been inducing what we call residual stresses, which are stresses that are there from the beginning of the structure and which undermine the ultimate load carrying capacity of the structure. <laughs> so this is an example, by the way, of what we sometimes call a redundant structure. For example, this trust has no hinge line naturally over this interior support that would allow it to lie flat between there and there and then slope downward between there and there. Um, there are basically two mechanisms for supporting this end. One is the column, 
and the other is the ability of this trust-like element to cantilever. So, in essence, there there are sort of two ways of supporting the uh, this portion of the truss, or we sometimes call this a redundant system. So some people might say, well, look, if somebody drives into this column and takes it out, this structure can still support it, so that's a good thing. It's not a good thing, though, if the structure is not properly uh, constructed geometrically so that we end up with a situation like this where one of these columns is low and it's inducing an undesirable stress and that stress is there from the beginning of the structure and will be there until some other load like a snow load comes along and fails the building. So whenever you say redundancy some people will say oh redundancy is always good but that's absolutely not true if, it's, if the structure is properly designed, redundancy can be a good thing. So a classic example of redundancy, by the way, is the World Trade Center, where huge numbers of columns were blown out, and still that building had a, a pathway for carrying loads down to the ground. So it wasn't until an entire floor of column got, got taken out, columns got taken out, by the uh, fire that the building finally collapsed. So the World Trade Center was one of the great examples of a redundant structure that actually worked extremely well, it just didn't have adequate fire protection. And it's worth pointing out, by the way, that it was built completely to code at the, in the time that it was constructed. It was even designed to take the force of the largest jet plane that existed at that point in time. Um, the problem was that, one, the jet planes have gotten much larger, and two, the jet planes that crashed into that building were carrying such a huge load of fuel that the fire was what ultimately brought the building down. Here's another example of redundant stress paths. This is the design for the Keenan Flagler School of Business in Chapel Hill. This is the stair. I got called in to do the three-dimensional structural analysis of the stair. And when the problem was originally posed to me by the engineer that hired me to do this problem, he said, assume that this is moment connected and cannot move vertically or horizontally at that point and the same for the end of this beam and the end of that beam. And so what I asked him was what do these cantilever beams that support this balcony, what are they attached to? And my argument was we might need to know that because we don't know for sure that these points are not going to move. My hope was they were attached to some kind of column so we would have a support on that side that would be as rigid as this side. These columns, by the way, shorten very little and there's extremely little motion. So when the engineer showed me, this was the plan. So these two columns right here in the plan view are this column and that column. And then you'll notice that there's some beams coming along. There's a moment connection and these are the cantilevers that support the balcony. So they're this beam and that beam and that beam and so forth at each floor. Those cantilevered beams are attached to this really long beam right here, which is able to deflect quite a bit. And then it's supported by this really long beam and that really long beam. And those in turn are supported by this beam and that beam. So one of the things I did was I simulated not only the, the uh, stair, but all of these, this beam structure to which this half of the stair was attached. And what I discovered was that the worst load on the stair was no load on the stair at all, but fully loading this floor, at which point these locations deflected so much that they were in essence crushing the stairs. So when I did that analysis, uh, 
this is what it looked like. Um, <clears throat> so this is with rigid supports and you'll notice there's not much deflection and there's not a huge amount of stress. But then when we move, allow these two points there and those two points and those two points to move downward with the beam deflection that would occur in that floor, what we're doing in essence is crushing the stairs and introducing very large bending stresses. The end result of that was that the engineer decided to go back and drastically beef up these beams. I wanted them to add some columns in here, but he said at that point there was no way they were going to change the design that much. So they pretty drastically reinforced this beam, that beam, and that beam in order to reduce some of that deflection. So the, the key message here is that you can't make presumptions about how things are supported. You have to go analyze whatever it is that's supporting them in order to make sure that whatever supporting them is stiff enough to allow them to function properly. Okay, the last topic is thermal stresses. When materials expand uh, as they heat, they can induce very serious stresses. When they shrink, they can develop tension and develop cracks. And most architecture students are already aware that every 30 feet or so, we need to introduce stress relieving grooves and things like a masonry wall so that this shrinkage effect doesn't adversely affect the appearance of the structure. We also have to worry about it from a structural point of view. For example, if you don't put stress, relief, stress relieving slotted connectors periodically in a, in a rail line for a train, those rails will buckle upward. Basically, this thermal stress is irresistible. There's no material that can stop it. If you heat something up enough, you will make it expand to the point that the material will fail. So the way we deal with uh, thermal expansion is in terms of something called a coefficient of expansion. So that's this right here. And it is in essence the change in length in inches divided by whatever the original length was in inches per degree. In our case, we deal with Fahrenheit degrees. So expansion due to thermal effects is fairly small, um, but it's inexorable. And if the, if the object is not able to expand appropriately, if it's somehow constrained, it will become severely damaged. So for example, for structural steel, uh, we have a coefficient like this. It's five zeros and a six five. So that's a, that says, for every degree, we have 65 parts uh, per 100,000. So it's very small, but very profoundly important. Aluminum is almost double that. If we skip on down here, by the way, we get to concrete. You'll notice concrete is in a range from five zeros with a five five to five zeros with a seven zero. In other words, concrete brackets steel. So here we have 55, 70, and somewhere in the middle is 65. You'll notice way outside of that range is aluminum. So this is one of the reasons why you could never reinforce concrete with aluminum because the two materials are materially inconsistent from a thermal point of view. And here's an example. This was a concrete slab ceiling and floor in a building. This, by the way, is a fluorescent fixture. That's not a high-rise building. It's not the ugliest high-rise building you've ever seen. It's just a fluorescent fixture that's attached to this ceiling slab. And in the case of this building, the builder used aluminum conduit, which seemed like a good idea. It's more rust resistant. It's more expensive. It must be better. So they used it 
and the concrete was cast on a fairly cool day and then when the temperature went up the aluminum expanded in a differential way and because concrete's not very good in tension the concrete basically was spalled off of or chipped off of the rest of the ceiling. The tensile, the expansion of the aluminum created tensile stresses that the concrete simply couldn't withstand. So you never use aluminum or any other material inside of concrete that has a differential a coefficient of thermal expansion. In this case, the problem was, was caused by two different kinds of material. There was the aluminum and the conduit, and then there was the concrete in which it was embedded. And those two materials are different in their thermal expansion. You can also have problems like this in material, in the same material where the thermal mass is different, so the rate of expansion is different. So this is an example. This was a building that was built out of concrete, and there's this super massive concrete frame around this lightweight concrete grill. And when the concrete grill was installed, it got mortared into place. So there was rigid material all around. And when the sun came out the next morning, uh, this grill heated up a lot faster than the surrounding structure. And basically the surrounding structure wouldn't allow it to do that. And so the grill shattered. So you see this, all this void up here is basically crumpled grill that exploded under those uh, expansion uh, stresses. So in this case, it was the same material with differential mass effects. In this case, it was different materials with different coefficients of expansion. This is just as damaging because the thermal mass effects caused the temperature of this grill to go up more, much more rapidly than this boundary material. That ends our video on wind oscillations, seismic forces, residual stresses, and thermal stresses, and also concludes our series of videos on loads on buildings.